Chomsky will tell you that Israel has refused to make peace since the beginning of its history. It's just not the case. If one looks back at any history, even some of the Palestinian histories, one will see very proudly boasting among many Palestinians that when the Peel Commission proposed the division of the mandate into a tiny little non-contiguous Jewish state and a very large Arab state, they never used the term Palestinian in those days, the, uh, the Jewish you should have accepted it reluctantly, and some didn't. Jabotinsky didn't, and uh, Begin didn't, but the Jewish establishment did, uh, Ben-Gurion did. The Palestinians did not. Uh, Haj al-Husseini, the head of the Palestinians, the leader of the Palestinians said, we don't want a Palestinian state, there is no such thing as Palestinians, we are southern Syrians, we are part of the Arab world, we just don't want there to be a Jewish state. That's in the Peel Commission testimony. You can simply find it by Googling it or going to the library and real, reading the Peel Commission testimony. The same thing happened, of course, in 1967 when Israel accepted the UN partition plan. The Palestinians said no. Five Arab countries invaded uh, Israel. In 67, Israel offered to trade land for peace. The Israelis sat by the phone waiting for Jordan to call, waiting for Egypt to call. There were no calls. There was a trip to Khartoum, the three no's. In 1990, the Oslo Accords, in 2000-2001, in the 1990s, the Oslo Accords, 2000-2001, the um, Camp David offers, which offered the Palestinians a contiguous state on 93 to 95% of the West Bank, and a divided Jerusalem and a $335 billion refugee package. Arafat said no, Israelis said yes, 2007. Uh, Omer offered the Palestinians even more, in my view, a mistake. I don't think you ever offer more than what was rejected previously and responded to with violence. You don't reward violence by offering more. I think symbolically it's important actually to offer just a little bit less, but certainly no more. But Omer offered more, and the Palestinians simply did not respond. The current Palestinian administration simply did not respond. And I was with Benjamin Netanyahu at the United Nations, was it two weeks ago or three weeks ago on Friday, when three things happened of significance. Abbas got up and made one of the worst speeches I have ever heard a Palestinian leader deliver, certainly since the untimely death of Yasser Arafat. I always say untimely because if he had only died three years earlier, there might have been peace in the Middle East because the Palestinians might well have accepted the Camp David Taba offers. But since the death of Arafat, no Palestinian has made a worse speech than the one Abbas made at the UN. He did not recognize any Jewish presence in the land of Israel or Palestine since the beginning of time. He talked about Christians and Muslims being present. He opened up no doors to peace. He offered no opportunity for negotiation. And then the second event that occurred was Netanyahu got up and spoke. I don't agree with every word he said, but he certainly sent a message loud and clear. We want to negotiate now, right here at the UN, today, tomorrow, we're all in New York. No three conditions. You will get a generous peace offer. Simply come down and sit and negotiate. No preconditions. There had previously been a precondition, namely recognizing Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. He took that precondition off the table and said no preconditions, and the Palestinians rejected that offer of uh, negotiation as well. <clears throat> so the hard question is how to get to where everybody knows we're ultimately going to get if there's going to be a two-state solution and real peace in the Middle East. Centrist point of view. Let me tell you what happened when I got invited to speak at the University of California in Davis and I'll end with this story. So I was invited a year before Michael Oren, and they tried to shout me down, and I'm just less polite than he is, and I shouted over them, and I just didn't let them shout me down. But once the audience was cleared of the disruptors, who didn't really want to stay, they just wanted to disrupt. I then turned to the audience, there were about a thousand people, and there were about a hundred on one side wearing the green and the flags of the Palestinians, and on the other side there were about a hundred wearing, you know, kippot and blue and white. And I turned to the audience and said, about how many of you would you describe yourselves as pro-Israel? People on that side raised their hand. How many of you describe yourself as pro-Palestinian? Hands went up. I said, I want to ask the pro-Israel group, how many of you would accept a democratic, secular Palestine living in peace with Israel 
on the West Bank, inland, et cetera, et cetera. Every single hand went up almost immediately. I then asked how many of the pro-Palestinians would accept a non-expansionist Israel, non-violent Israel, living side by side. There was mumbling among them. Not a single hand went up. The debate was over. It was clear to the 800 people in the middle, this wasn't pro-Israel, pro-Palestine. It was pro-Israel, pro-Palestine on one side, anti-Israel, anti-Palestine, because they weren't so interested in there being a Palestinian state. They were just interested in there not being an Israeli state or a Jewish state on the other side. And so I think it's critically important that you appeal to the center. It's critically important that your arguments go to those who are undecided. You will never persuade Noam Chomsky. It's like you put your dollar in the soda machine and the dollar doesn't come out and the soda doesn't come out. <laughs> you want to yell at the machine, you want to talk to the machine, nothing's going to help. You're tempted to kick the machine, don't do it. 